Good morning. My name is Randy Burns. I serve as an elder here at Old Fort Baptist Church. And for the second week running, I will be uh, bringing your Sunday school lesson to you this morning. And uh, we will be finishing out the month of July with recorded Sunday school lessons for those of you that uh, need to get your lesson that way. And I do want to, uh, again, welcome you this morning. And uh, we're going to be t uh, looking into the book of uh, Luke, beginning in uh, chapter 14, or excuse me, chapter 9. And we're going to be looking at Jesus teaching about the cost of discipleship. And as we start, let me begin with a word of prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, this lesson is so rich. It has so much for us today, Lord. Lord, I just, I just pray right now that uh, you'll help me not to mess it up. Lord, just uh, push me out of the way. Lord, just uh, speak through me. Speak to every person that is listening this morning. And Lord, just... Uh, Lord, this is a challenging lesson for us. It has challenged me. I pray that it will challenge those that hear it this morning. Father, help us to understand what the cost of discipleship is. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you're going to speak to us through your word this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, Jesus teaches us about the cost of discipleship and we live in a time of growing intolerance. We're seeing that more and more. Although compared to other places in the world, we might still say that in, in our Western society, our Western culture, it's still advantageous to be a Christian here. Although we're beginning to feel the pressure to compromise. You know, there's, there's all, uh, there are all things that modern Americans claim to love. Uh, some of them say it's being a member of a local church. And quite honestly, it's even though some of those who are what we might refer to as CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only, the holiday Christians. There's those who may say that they still uh, desire to donate to a favorite Christian charity. But as long as it's not a pro-life charity. There's those who might claim to generally be a moral person, but they don't want their morality to infringe on the uh, morality choice of another. It can be described as obedience with conditions. Jesus, does, he requires an obedience without conditions. He wants us to have a true and radical commitment to him. He requires that our obedience actually counter our culture. And that is an obedience that will cost you. And that's what we're here to talk about this morning. The true commitment, this true commitment could cost you much. We could sit here and name a lot of things. But just one, it could cost you uh, some, some of your livelihood. It could cost you some family connections. It could cost you some friends. It could eventually take one's life. We see that going on in other parts of our world today. So how does the world view a true disciple of Jesus Christ? In many cases, with a growing hostility, as I said earlier. You know, Jesus' requirement for total commitment is not an easy task, but it's one he calls us to. And Jesus is there to help us answer that call. He taught that being His disciple comes at a cost. It involves a clear and total commitment. And it will involve sacrifice. You know, committing your life to Jesus as His disciple means we emulate the very one who laid down His life on our behalf for our salvation. If Jesus is our leader and He was willing to lay down our life, and we're going to emulate Him, we have to be willing to do that. That's the greatest sacrifice we can make. The Bible teaches us that. Think about what is a true sacrifice. A true sacrifice, whether it's financially, whether it's time, whether it's standing up for what's right, 
it's going to leave an empty place. It's going to leave what I call a hole. It's, um, it hurts. You give up something. There's a lot of times when, when we might make a donation to something and say, well, I sacrificed. That, not really. Not really. A sacrifice is going to hurt a little bit. And we're going to see this today in three different passages of Scripture. We're going to begin in Luke chapter 9 and look at verses 57 through 62. And this is when Jesus is uh, telling us that a disciple, being a disciple requires a clear commitment. 57 through 62. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, Foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. Lord, he said, First let me go and bury my father. But he told him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the good news of the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Right here we see that Jesus is not sugarcoating this. He's given a clear expectation for those who want to be his disciples. You know, uh, each time someone pledged to follow him he tested that commitment he let them know exactly what they were signing up for what jesus was actually saying is if you can't fully commit it's best for you to walk away now jesus is clear a commitment to truly follow him is the hardest thing that you or i will ever do it can make you face fears you've never imagined it can get you out of your comfort zone and into a space that you never envisioned. It will require that you uh, that require of you things that you never thought you would ever have to give up. Jesus reminds us following him isn't just something that we say. It's something that we do. Following Jesus means putting him above all else as we read here in the scriptures it's putting putting him in front of our comfort in front of our duty our wealth and our and our family as far as the comfort it can lead you to a nomadic lifestyle without a nice place to lay your head it take you out of that comfort zone that we might be in uh, if you've ever been on the mission field as i have and short-term mission trips and you see some of these men and women that have do have have given their entire life to the mission field and they're living in some harsh conditions they don't have that comfortable place to lay their head they're in some tough spots but they're doing it because that's what jesus has called them to do and they have obeyed as far as duty and wealth this call is immediate even at the expense of burying a loved one. You know, when this man made this plea to Jesus, it's believed that he was saying, I want to wait until my father dies so I can gain my inheritance, and then I'll come follow you. It's not a very true commitment right there. It can cost you family. Following Jesus, you may have to miss important events in the lives of your, of your uh, family. Worse yet, you may have your family reject you. I know of a person living in our area that when she accepted Christ as her Savior, her family disowned her because of, the, uh, they, of a differing religious belief. It can cost you that much. Following Him means putting Him above everything. Discipleship is a process that grows into spiritual maturity as you follow Christ. Following Him requires our whole life, not just our mind. It contains action. It puts feet to it. But we see over in Luke chapter 14, being Jesus' disciple requires a total 
commitment. And we see this in verses 25 through 27. Now great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That really sounds harsh. You know, the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother is the one that comes with a promise. And Jesus constantly was reinforcing that commandment. Over in Matthew 15, Jesus rebuked, you can read this, uh, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees where they were commanding people to give money to the temple instead of caring for their own parents. The Pharisees wanted to get their hands on that money instead of these people caring for their aged parents. Over in Matthew 19, Jesus, when he was talking to the rich young ruler, he uh, says that honoring parents is one of the commandments necessary to obey for eternal life. And then we can read this in John 19 when Jesus was on the cross and he looked down at John and he gave John the command to take care of his mother. Uh, he showed his care for her at that point. So God is not the author of confusion, not ever. What he's doing is reminding us of the priorities of God and his son in our lives. You know, when Jesus was talking about the commandments, and he summed those up into, into two commandments, actually. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor could be a neighbor, a stranger, even your own family, even your father and mother. But the first commandment, to love the Lord with all that we have, all that we are. So that's the priorities right there. Now, what are some ways that you might can display a total commitment to Jesus? There's many, just a few here, leaving home, even leaving country. Maybe going across the street to take the gospel to another. Sacrificing our preferences. You know, here, let's just face it, here in church we all have preferences. We need to be willing to sacrifice those, sacrifice those desires. Some even sacrifice their lives. There's mar martyrs uh, that are uh, giving their life every day across our world in the name of Jesus Christ. We haven't come to that point. We haven't come to that point. Being willing to address the sin of a loved one or a friend. Pointing out that they need to change. And also confessing our own sin. Seeking forgiveness. These are just some of the ways that we can display a total commitment to Jesus. We should love Him so much that our love for ourselves and for others looks like hatred in comparison. That doesn't mean that we're going to show or display hatred toward them. It means that our love for Jesus should be so strong that the love for ourselves or others just pales in comparison. There is no comparison in that. None of us enjoys pain or harm. I'm not looking forward to any of that myself. Yet Jesus calls His disciples to be willing to even die, even if it was death on a cross. You know, it's, it's kind of like playing the long game. I'm not sure. I think that might be uh, a golf phrase. But... If our aim is to preserve our lives in this world, in the here and now, then we're going to lose. You know, in Luke 9, 25, Jesus said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? We've got people right now that are banking on everything in this world as the, as the number one thing in their life. They're going to lose their life in hell if they don't make a change. But if we take up our cross in willingness to die with and for Jesus Christ, then we will find them for eternity in heaven with the Lord. 
And that should be our goal. Jesus also requires a costly commitment. In, again, in chapter 14, verses 28 through 35. For which of you, wanting to build a tower, does it first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, This man started to build but wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all of his possessions cannot be my disciple. Now salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. You know, it's impossible to, to calculate the true cost of following Jesus. You know, it could cost you everything, and meaning your life. You know, Jesus used illustrations in this passage of building a tower or going to war to demonstrate to his listeners that following him isn't something that you just uh, wake up one day and decide without first counting the cost. You just decide, hey, I want to follow Jesus today. I want to be one of his disciples. You have to, you have to first count the cost. It's not something you do half-heartedly. It's a commitment that you need to be seeing through to the end. It is like going to war. Discipleship comes with consequences. We are willing to either fight to the death or else surrender. There's no middle ground. Jesus tells us to take up our cross and follow him. It's a lifelong task with eternal significance. We must ask ourselves this. This is a very important question. Am I more concerned about others' salvation or about my own situation? We need to ask ourselves that question today. Are we more concerned about the salvation of those around us or about our own situation. Paul tells us in Scripture to evaluate ourselves. Evaluate our salvation. That's a question we need to really truthfully think on. When we become disciples of Jesus, we hand Him the keys to it. We hand Him over all our possessions. Then we become stewards of what is now His and how he decides to use it. We count the cost. Again, referring to the rich young ruler, in Luke 18, chapter 18, Jesus told him, he said, go sell your possessions and then come and follow me. But the man went away sad, we're told, because he had many possessions. You know, following Jesus is not a desire for earthly recognition or personal gain. But yet this man made that choice. Again, we need to stop and think. Costing Discipleship and following Jesus is going to cost you. And, and as we said, it could cost you to surrender finances. Your reputation may suffer. Uh, you may have to leave a job because of it. Disciples who try to hold on to the stuff of this world, the sin of this world, are showing where their true allegiance lies. It's this world. It's not Jesus. <laughs> you know, I was thinking of a little illustration. Uh, being in a little country uh, school in seventh grade, I had a desire to play sports, and I wanted to play football. Had never been allowed to play. We weren't in a position to go play in any type of youth league or anything. We didn't have those. So my seventh grade year, I got, to, I got to be on the team. Although, I was just learning the game, didn't know very much. And really, I'm not even sure if I ever got on the field. And I remember one game toward the end of the season as I was walking off. We had on our white jerseys and white pants. 
And of course, mine was very white. It was very clean. And I can remember two classmates making fun of me, talking about how clean my uniform was. You know, as a disciple of Christ, we may wear the uniform at times, but never get into the game. In other words, our uniform may not get very dirty. And I'm not talking dirty sin, I'm talking dirty from work. You know, fortunately, my, my next year, I progressed and I got to play a lot and my uniform got dirty. We need to be about that. If you're going through your Christian life and your, your, your Christian uniform is not getting dirty, you need to take a look at what you're doing. You know, there's times when we all can be complacent or even fearful at what our discipleship is going to cost us. I mean, who can actually truly live up to the perfect standard that Jesus set before us? That's what we strive to do. So when you pray this week, and I pray that you're in the Word and you're praying daily, we need to just ask Jesus, Lord, show me how I can be salt and light to this world that's going in, a, in the wrong direction. In our Sunday school lesson, there is a uh, thing called Voices of the Church, from Voices from Church History. And I think this one is worth reading. It's written by a man named J.C. Ryle back in the 1800s. But it's, it's very good for today. He says, it, co- it does cost something to be a real Christian according to the standard of the Bible. There are enemies to be overcome, battles to be fought, sacrifices to be made, and Egypt to be forsaken, a wilderness to be passed through, a cross to be carried, and a race to be run. Conversion is not putting a man in an armchair and then taking him easily to heaven. It is the beginning of a mighty conflict in which it costs much to win the victory. You know, we've been in Luke today, and how many times that I've read back in Luke 9, 23 through 26, where Jesus said to them all, If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What is a man benefited if he gains the whole world, yet loses or forfeits himself? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in that of the Father and the holy angels. You know, you're never really ready to live until you're prepared to die. That's a, that's a statement that I heard just recently, and, and I'm going to repeat that one more time as I close. We are not ready to live until we are prepared to die. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are prepared to die to yourself, possibly your own life, to your finances, to whatever else gets in your way. Maybe today you're listening And you know you're not prepared to die. You haven't made Jesus that that priority in your life. You need to give your life to a Savior. You need to commit to Him. And I pray that if, if you're in that situation today that you'll reach out. Maybe you'll call our church office or you'll reach out to someone that you know is salt and light. And that you will... Commit your life to Jesus Christ. It's not easy. It's a challenge. It's the most challenging thing you will ever do in your life. But it is also the most rewarding. So that's my prayer for you today, that you will do that. And for those of us who are disciples, that we will count the cost. We will make a firm commitment. And we will be more concerned about the salvation of others than our own situation. Let's close with prayer. 
Heavenly Father, Lord, we just again thank you, Father, for your word. It's a challenging word, Lord. And Lord, it's, it's, it's something that I know when I looked over this and studied it, Father, it, it, it just convicted me. Lord, I pray that it's going to convict many of us, Lord. We're, we're in a time that, Lord, you've placed us here, that we, we can be salt and light. Lord, we can, we can make those sacrifices, Lord. And it's not for people to look at us and admire us, but Lord, it's to simply bring other people to know Jesus Christ and for you to get the glory and the honor through all of it, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone that's listened to this this morning. And I just pray, Lord, that we will go out boldly in your name to serve you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.